Hello everybody, so Button Night Dragon Hammer and welcome back to Tokyo Babel. Now then, in the last episode, we had ourselves a bit of a sensory overload with Belial's training. Now then, let us move forward, hold on a moment, yes. Let us move forward into the Burning Abyss. I just saw the title of the fi save file, just the two of us. Alright. I pushed myself away from the ground and took to the skies, soaring straight towards Tokyo Dome. Flames erupted in all directions, a raging inferno burning bright like a veil of crimson. I soared upwards, going as high as I possibly could, then cast my gaze on the sports field. The moment I did, I felt a terrible chill surge through my body, even in the midst of the boiling heat. Fear. My heart raced in my chest like a locomotive. Could I have felt that chill due to the sheer abnormality of the sight I now beheld? Clutching my chest, I inspected my surroundings and spotted several burnt corpses down below. They weren't simply dead bodies, though. They were all impaled on massive stakes. The way their bodies burned reminded me, as horrible as that may sound, of meat on a skewer. <laughs> to my horror, I watched as the corpses wriggled in the midst of the flames. Impossible. They were still alive? As the screams echoed throughout the area, the impaled victims all began desperately squirming on their stakes. The overwhelming, repulsive wretchedness of it all made my stomach turn. I was unable to tell whether those people still lived, or if they were being kept alive by something. They might very well have been dead men wriggling to a puppeteer's tune, or perhaps slaves to some other unknown force. What I did know was that I needed to find and defeat the master of this stratum as soon as possible. I made myself focus on something else. These people were simply background scenery. Their cries of terror mere auditory hallucinations. I exiled the horrific sight to a distant corner of my mind so it wouldn't hinder me during combat. I made my way to the center, surrounded at all angles by flames violent enough to shroud my vision. But there was someone standing at the baseball mound. It was without a doubt the master of this stratum, either Hinoe Wataru or his guardian demon. I couldn't believe my eyes and simply stared in awe at what I was seeing forgetting for a moment even the oppressive heat. Someone had stabbed Hinoe Wataru with a sword. Someone had killed the man who was supposed to be the master of this entire realm. Really? Ooh, creepy smile. Someone who could easily trample even a man as terrifying as the fire-clad Hinoe Wataru. Crushing him like a child would have, would have discarded toy. It was a young man of smallish frame, his back adorned by six wings of azure fire. The number of wings he possessed indicated that he belonged to the Order of Seraphs, one of the higher ranking angels in the celestial hierarchy. After nonchalantly tossing Inoue Wataru's lifeless body aside, he turned to look at me. And so our eyes met. He let out a laugh. His smile broadened as he uttered those words, prompting me to involuntarily retreat back a few steps. A person who could very well have been Hinoe Wataru had just been killed by him. Who in the world was he? The Flame of God. That's, um... Is that... Michael, or was that Uriel? I can't remember which one it was. The moment he uttered those words, the boy's identity became clear as day. He was no ordinary being. He had to be one of the four master angels, the one bearing the title of the Flame of God. And my... Uh, wait. Wait. Uriel! Moete, moete. Fucking Christ! He looked upon me with a, hollow, with a hollow gaze, his smile grim like the dark of midnight. 
イリスもあの娘もアスタロトもカマエヌもベリアルもそしてパンドラも全てが燃えてしまえば何もかも終わるのさ OK! His words drilled into my heart like the echo of a joyous gospel. That was a dangerous sign, so I promptly sealed his words away in that isolated corner of my mind to protect myself from mental contamination. In the end, I managed to regain my composure. Uriel stopped for stepped forward. His intentions, whether he was a friend or foe, were clear as day. I pulled up the Bacati sword. According to Lilith, the fact that I had now learned to control magic should have amplified its power. And indeed, just holding it in my hand allowed me to feel the tremendous amount of magical energy coursing through its blade. Even I found myself surprised. Did it hold power equaling that of Uriel, though? The answer was no. Yuri's expression contorted with anger as his mouth gaped open. The moment that scream left his lips, I found my body blown clear away by a magical force of astonishing magnitude, rolling and tumbling backwards at high speed. As he blew me away, I crashed into a row of audience seats, destroying everything in my path, be it the plastic chairs, the metal railing, or the concrete steps, finding my body half embedded in the ground. That was no attack. All he did was scream. The sheer horror of that realization sent a chill down my spine. His very scream displayed power enough to send me flying. His rank as one of the four greats came as no surprise indeed. However, he seemed to have long since been robbed of all shred of reason and, and intelligence. And he's lost his mind. The echo of his frenzied cries permeated my heart, filling me with dread. I gritted my teeth and fought back against it, isolating the fear. I rose to my feet and after a few moments of hesitation, chose to summon the sin of sloth. A large wave of molten gold rained down on him at all at once. Uriel, however, evaporated it all with a single wave of his hand. And just like that, I lost sight of him. <laughs> Even if I failed to detect him with my eyes, I could sense the vector of his magical energies to pinpoint his location, which was... I had two options, to leap or to counterattack. I chose the latter. I flung my blade to the right without leaving time for myself to even see what was there. A clean hit. <laughs> Jesus! Uriel stopped my blade with his bare hands as droplets of fresh blood trickled to the concrete floor below, letting out a sizzling noise as they reached the ground. <laughs> A moment later, the temperatures around us rose to unimaginable heights. I used all my power to erect a protective water barrier, but its soothing influence lasted a mere heartbeat. Uriel's violent blast sent me flying to the skies. A wave of intense azure flame lashed out at Uriel's wings, coiling it into a tornado as it crashed into me. The attack sent me flying all the way to the large road stretching outside the dome. The fact that none of my limbs were torn off in the blast bordered on the miraculous. No doubt an effect of the astounding amount of magic I used up in the process. I landed near the three girls and heard Sormi gasp in surprise. Setsuna! Analyzing combat prowess, it was the three of us against Uriel on his own. Although we had the advantage in terms of sheer numbers, he exceeded us in raw power. In conclusion, the chances of defeat remained staggeringly high. Yeah. Lilith uttered his name with a trembling voice. Sormi attempted to rush to my side, but the demon managed to hold her back. Setsuna! I nodded at her to signal I was all right. As Raziel propped me up, Uriel took his time flying over to us, seizing us with his wicked glare. I briefly exchanged looks with Lilith, 
She nodded, then took Sormi and retreated to a safe distance. His expression, the very air around him, and above all else, his volcanic zeal. Uriel turned to Razio, his lips curling into a smile. Uriel's words flowed calm and serene as he clutched his head with both hands, a touch of fury blending into his madness. His question must have chilled Raziel to the very core, even as she stood in the midst of flames. Uriel spread his arms wide, brimming with hostility and bloodlust. This... this thing was a monster. The terrifying intensity of his madness made me certain of that. Even the headache and hallucination I experienced before came bubbling back up. Out of my way. I have no time for you. She hadn't done a thing. Raziel lacked something critical to be able to assert that claim. Her memories, once pertained to the Divine Calamity, things she should have never have forgotten. <laughs> Getting a freaking Gilgamesh feel from you. Yeah, <laughs> Actually, now that I think about it, for some reason, I got for like a split second, I thought that Uriel's Japanese VA kind of reminded me of um, Ren Okumura. Overwhelmed, Raziel took a step backwards. Uriel's expression of fury abruptly shifted to that of profound joy. Although Uriel's chaotic train of thought was difficult to follow, Raziel nonetheless found herself frozen in place upon hearing that one certain word. Raziel questioned him as her whole body trembled with fear. Yurio flashed a maddened smile and pointed straight up at the sky. So the sixth stratum was Kanda. Raziel's tone had turned to ice cold. Damn. I like you, Raziel. Uriel's body trembled upon hearing Raziel's grim proclamation, and then he roared with laughter. <laughs> His rage exploded. Suddenly, Uriel's expression changed to one of uncertainty. Oddly enough, Uriel found himself puzzled by his own words. As Raziel and I stared at him in confusion, he quickly shook his head and went on in his usual tone. So for like a split second, it looked like he regained his sanity, but then immediately lost it again. Uh, 
民に敬意を払わなかったことなどないだからだだから僕は天国にいる資格がある I felt my heart race faster as he uttered that one word Heaven Was Uriel there once? 待てウリエル今あなたは天国にいる資格があると言ったあの震災後もそこにいたのかいたさ僕はいつも通りいつも通りじゃないか選ばれなかった天使たちが消えたせいで随分と広くなったからね選ばれた善良な人間選ばれた天使素敵な場所だったさ A wonderful place. If that were truly the case, then. My guess would have been work. His duty as the flame of God was to monitor the gates of hell and punish sinners. That, that would explain why he left heaven. You fled? You fled? Fear and despair darkened his gaze now, robbing it of its former near ecstatic madness. Uriel, Uriel crouched on the ground, clutching his head with both hands. The hell's going on in heaven? Uriel, Uriel! Sensing a lust for battle from the maddened angel, I tightened my grip on the Bacati sword. As Uriel kept mumbling to himself, he once again stood up and began approaching us. Jesus, dude, calm down. Raziel pulled out her tablet, connecting its cable to her own wrist. Oh, hot damn! Raziel's gaze was cold as ice, her entire being overflowing with a tremendous amount of magical energy. In the amount of time it took me to in inhale, then exhale a breath, Raziel had already lunged at Uriel. Her fist landed a clean hit on the other angel. <laughs> Uriel exploded with elated fury while shooting azure flames in Raziel's direction, who despite taking a direct hit that sent her flying backwards, recovered soon after. <laughs> I immediately responded to her, mobilizing my magic reserves to call forth the power of the Bacati sword. The beast materialized in the world, bearing its terrible fangs at Uriel. You're fucking Gilgamesh! Uriel latched onto the nape of the colossal beast, crushing it without a shred of hesitation. As he once again turned his attention back to me, it was Raziel's turn to launch an attack. The very ground Uriel stood on turned to water, extinguishing the nearby flames while blanketing the whole area with cool air. Uriel's roar echoed throughout the air. As Raziel was blown far into the distance, Uriel turned his attention back to me, gaze overflowing with contempt. And with that, I mustered all my strength to hurl the Bacati sword in Uriel's direction. 
If this was an ordinary blade, Uriel could easily deflect it without breaking a sweat. However, the blade I wielded once belonged to Uriel himself. This forced him to hesitate for just a heartbeat, knowing this could very well be his one last chance, his one chance to retrieve the blade. He should not have done that. He should have deflected the sword, then calmly picked it up once he had either killed or immobilized me. The reason behind Uriel's hesitation was twofold. First off, I began swiftly advancing at him. Secondly, he had most likely never found himself in a situation like this before. Aside from combat being a series of rapid decision making, it also depended heavily on how each participant interpreted said choices and how swiftly they could derive an optimal solution in the heat of battle. That was the natural conclusion I myself had arrived at after fighting Gethel, Abdiel, and Beliel. Each of my opponents displayed more monstrous prowess. One wrong move could invite a swift death. Unless I prepared myself, I would only end up buckling under the intense pain. I speculated that Uriel had never once wrestled with such thoughts. To him, who had been born a powerful angel, combat merely meant instilling fear in his enemies as he trampled them underfoot with overwhelming power. The fact had become evident from the way he fought, in which case, defeating Uriel meant stirring panic, bewilderment, and hesitation in his heart. I amplified my speed through the power of air while tapping into earth to strengthen my internal weapons. My right arm swelled in size, crashing into Uriel's jaw in a powerful uppercut. Just as I raised my fist to land a follow-up blow, Uriel slammed a kick into my abdomen that sent me flying. <laughs> Grabbing me by the neck, Uriel slammed me into the asphalt below, then as if driven by a maddening compulsion, repeated it again and again and again. Raziel leapt our way, intent on doing something to help. However, Uriel held up my body to shield himself from the female angel. With my neck being squeezed tighter and tighter, I felt my consciousness fade. And so did the pain. I found myself liberated from the jaws of fire and the crippling sensation of having my neck crushed. I made a feeble attempt to break free from his grasp, to no avail. My strength had all but left me. I would soon die here. And I might even be content with that outcome. However, just as I was ready to succumb to that train of thought, I felt a peculiar chill rush through my entire body. Almost as if someone had peeked into my mind. As my vision began to fade, Uriel's gaze, a mixture of bloodlust and pure disgust, pierced into me. He must have peeked into my memories. He spewed one abusive expl expletive after another, yet I was bothered by not a syllable of it. I had already leveled at myself all the wicked language I could think of, cursing my own existence, loathing what I had done. As such, only one objective burned vividly in mind now. Finding a way to overcome the obstacle that was Uriel, I needed to think of nothing else. Using Takemikazuchi, the god of thunder, would yield no results here. Uriel's name may have indicated the flame of god, yet the ancient scriptures of Judaism treated it as lightning. Hino Kagutsuchi, the god of flames, would similarly be out of the question. My opponent was fire incarnate. I would never be able to surpass him, not even by tapping into magic. The god of might, then? Unlikely. The sheer strength he slammed me into the ground a short while ago far exceeded the boost I could gain from the power of Tajiko... Tajiko... Kar <clears throat> I could say the other of three is perfectly fine. Tajikarawo. As my mind sifted through the various strategies that could be utilized in defeating Uriel, every single possibility gave back a clear error message. None of them would work. In a matter of seconds, he would break my neck. This much was certain. So what was I to do? How was I supposed to act? How? <laughs> Water burst forth right next to where Uriel was standing, biting into his elbow like a serpent. However, a single swing of his arm sent the water serpent to oblivion. He then flashed a satisfied grin. お前のおかげで僕は自身のレゾンデートルを再確認できた。僕はバッスルものだ。憤怒の象徴である炎と懲罰の象徴である稲妻を使ってあまたの人間をくびり殺すものなんだ。
In one broad swing, Uriel held my body aloft and hurled it towards Raziel. As I crashed into Raziel, the two of us were blown all the way back to the Tokyo Dome. I only blacked out for a mere second, but that period of time was more than enough for Uriel to move to an elevated position. The situation had just turned from bad to worse. Displaying magical prowess surpassing what I had experienced during my training session with Belial, Uriel brandished a huge metal pillar about three meters in length. It was a massive door bolt. I assumed it had been used to bar the gates of hell, to protect the angel's many divine secrets. The colossal pillar in Uriel's grass split open to a myriad parts, each fragmented and imbu a fragment imbued with terrifying magical power. I couldn't. Raziel's body had been weakened from the damage she sustained while I crashed into her, rendering her un unable to move. With little chance I may have of escaping, I had now cast it all aside. I threw my arms wide open, sheltering her. Feeling strangely refreshed, yet not intoxicated. If anything, I was completely calm and at ease. This had to be my race on there, to die for the sake of another, without obstructive thoughts and hindering feelings. Accompanied by a deafening roar, the pillar fragments discharged a bolt of fierce light. My body was pierced, my flesh mercilessly ravaged by high voltage electricity. A feeling of intense numbness rushed along my right elbow, left knee, left shoulder, right ankle, my side, and left wrist, and exploded with pain. I felt myself being eroded away. A violent scream filled my ears. Reve relieved that I had managed to protect her, I turned to smile at Raziel, yet found myself taken aback by her horror-stricken expression. Could I really say I had protected her? Raziel should have used the time I bought her to and escaped. I firmly believed she would do that. However, she collapsed on her knees, refusing to leave my side. I couldn't believe it. I didn't want to. <laughs> I recalled what Belial had taught me about proclaiming one's race on dare, about discharging a large amount of magic to protect one's inner world onto the outside world. There had to be a downtime during that process. Beckon you, flee while they're still. <laughs> Raziel violently shook her head and clung on to me, almost like an unruly child refusing to let go of their mother. Another few seconds and Uriel would fully recover. Once that time came, he would muster all his magic to kill both me and Raziel. I calculated the likelihood of such an outcome to be 98%, certainly the kind of odds that would drive one to despair. But I would have none of it. Blood rushed up my throat, but I gulped it back down. I struggled to my feet, my ankles still in ruin while enduring unimaginable pain. Unable to maintain my balance, I collapsed back onto my knees. I needed to protect them. Mankind, the angels, the demons, all living things. God. Through mankind's desires, I once bore that name. But no longer. I stood here today as a mortal man, as weapon, machine, and slave. My mission was to protect Lilith, Sormi, and Raziel. A duty I carried out as best as I could. But now, it was no longer within my capabilities. Uriel's strike had just put me on the verge of death and I would be struck down by a blow truly befitting one of the four Master Angels. My heart would soon be in its last. My mind had comprehended its impending demise. A reason for being. I once thought that accomplishing my mission, or keeping my companions safe, would stand as my raison d'etre. In the end, I was both right and wrong. This much I could say. I did not come this far, nor did I shoulder all this sin, only to have it end on this accursed third stratum. <laughs> I gripped my teeth, struggling to endure the crippling pain. I had to stand up. I had to face him in battle and survive the ordeal. 
to protect Orazio. I had to overturn the odds, no matter what. A click. Something resounded deep within me. A cogwheel. A mechanical gear sprang to life in the depths of my soul, where once there had been nothing. My heart, my lungs, muscles, and brain all came alive once more, driven by a singular purpose. To live. To survive. To fight and prevail. To fulfill that purpose, I needed something. A blade coated in sorcery, its lethal swing ready to fell all on its path. Or a shield of dazzling crystal, stalwart and unflinching against even the most terrifying of odds. No, I needed no weapons or armor, for I could wield neither. Uriel was a veritable monster, a fatal deficiency in my own analytical capabilities preventing me from conjuring up armaments that could surpass his strength, or protective equipment that might withstand his fury. There existed several requirements before I could truly become invincible, requirements I'd yet to fulfill. And the one thing that could serve me best in the situation were legs that could carry me beyond space and time. Create it. Conjure it. Will it into existence with utmost haste. Tap into the power slumbering within you. All I had to do was apprehend the dimensional theory and construct a mechanism that could function within its framework. Everything I required was right here. If not, I simply had to force it into existence. That was as far as I could go, yet it was more than enough. I clung onto the faint glimmer of the theory I managed to unearth, desperate not to let go. In order to live, to survive, to protect. Space itself had been distorted, a number of thin cracks running along reality, light seeping in through their slits. I chose one and grabbed Raziel by the arm. Moments before I leapt into the dimensional tier, tear, I spotted Lilith in the distance. She threw something my way. I caught it without even checking what it was, then proceeded through the tear. Screaming various obscenities our way, Uriel leapt inside the tear in pursuit, but that was as far as he could go. This place was merely a narrow rift existed within the crevice of reality. Its very existence crawled and coiled in the form of a shapeless slime, lacking an earth and a sky, its coordinates fickle at best. Without a focused mind, it became difficult to tell whether one was even advancing or retreating through this realm. Either way, I took Raziel by the hand and proceeded forward, soaring onwards with renewed determination. That was my foremost concern. In your dreams, Uriel. I glanced down at my feet, spotting that they had sprouted a series of mechanical wings. Relying on them, I quickened my pace, escaping the angel's clutches. Suppose I mustered every last drop of strength I still had left, sacrificing many a thing in the process. Yet that would still not guarantee the maddened angel's demise. Even if it did, there would be no meaning to it. That was the last conclu that was the conclusion I had arrived at. That train of thought that now drove me to flee like a coward. In order to keep living, surviving and protecting others, I fled and fled as swift as the wind, finally leaping into another dimensional rift. Damn it! Though Uriel was hot on our heels in pursuit, the rift closed a mere heartbeat before he could enter it. As I glanced back, his eyes met mine through the tiny crevice before it closed up for good. Fuck! I silently looked at him in, in the eye, enduring the abuse and the explosive waves of unchained bloodlust. The rift finally closed up, giving us much needed time to take in our surroundings. Where the hell are we? We were inside Tokyo Babel, that much was certain, and in a place other than the first, second, or third strata. Could possibly have been a stratum beyond that, somewhere between the fourth and the seventh. Raziel nodded, pointing at a nearby building in a very matter-of-fact way. Raziel 
今はひとまず動かないことが感じどうしてラゼル returned my question with a puzzled look。セツナの今の体では戦うどころか歩くこともできない。Her words brought back some recent memories. My body was in terrible shape, tattered from head to toe. The pain soon returned as well, now that my battle with Uriel was done and I had calmed down. As I collapsed onto the ground, Raziel hurriedly ran up to me. As Raziel's magic began its work, a smile involuntary crept onto my lips. Upon hearing my words, Raziel's expression ended up colored by a touch of discontent. For some reason, I found myself consciously making conversation, injecting remark after remark as Raziel kept working. You pissed off the white mage, goddammit, Setsuna. I found it kind of adorable how she responded in a sulking tone. Especially since her hands didn't show even a hint of stopping despite her words. She didn't even give me time to ask exactly what would be fine. Enduring the pain, I set all the nano machines coursing in my veins to work, ordering them to begin regenerating my body. Although we ended up stranded with just the two of us, I still found myself at ease. Damn. I'm not gonna lie, that was freaking awesome. This place could be the fifth, sixth, or seventh stratum. If this was the sixth stratum, then the book town of Kanda would have to be here. Driven by that possibility, Raziel soared even faster. I soon gave up on the idea. Among the rows of ruined buildings, she spotted a factory like complex that stood still stood in a decent shape. It was clearly not a bookstore. Tsukiji Market. The Tsukiji Market, one of the finest fish markets in Japan. Needless to say, this place is completely deserted. However, all the fish were still neatly lined up at the stalls, leading the lending the area a positively eerie atmosphere. Although people often use the expression, to have eyes like a dead fish, the way these things were lined up here seared the image of death into my mind. Yeah, fish are kind of smelly. The place was laden with the stench of fish, something Raziel found somewhat difficult to endure. In any case, it had become clear that this wasn't the sixth stratum. Provided Uriel spoke the truth, and he most likely did, even in madness, the angel had no reason to lie. As such, it stood to reason that this was either the fifth or the seventh stratum. That there would be one way to make sure, to have a look on the outside of Tokyo Babel. Yeah, that would be far too dangerous, and Raziel feared getting swept off the soaring purgatory without a fully able Setsuna at her side. One thing was clear in her mind, though, that not a soul had been to this place since the foundation of Tokyo Babel. Yet here she was now, her Nintendo Setsuna. After a moment of delight, Raziel realized something of utmost importance. Oh, come on! A place beyond the reach of angels, demons, and possibly even the Lord himself. This could very well have been a critical moment for her, in more ways than one. And so she floated onwards, that one thought never once leaving her mind. Ah, good lord. I struggled to my feet, confirming the successful recovery of all the essential components of my body. Bones, muscles, skin, nerves, veins. I clenched my fist, then lightly tapped the ground with my feet. Yes. Another hour and I'd be as good as new. All I had left to do was signal to Raziel and decide how we should proceed from here. We had three options to consider. One, search for a way back to Pandora. Two, wait here until help arrives. Three, keep pressing on. It was still far too early for number two. We would only need to consider it if number one and number three became impossible to carry out, which ultimately left with a choice between those two. Number one, certainly felt the most reasonable option to pick, but I glanced down the silver key in my palm. The one that once belonged to Soromi. Back then, Lilith must have hurled the key my way because she expected something like this to happen. Either way, how are we to proceed? Naturally, I would first have to discuss it with Raziel, but I still felt I should give it some thought of my own, too. If this place turned out to be the seventh stratum, our choice was clear. We would press on and open the gates of heaven. We could easily bring an end to this struggle and Soromi wouldn't have to risk her life any longer. 
she could return to the peaceful life she once had. Furthermore, no one else would have to become a pilgrim. I would be the last. But what if this place turned out to be the fifth or the sixth stratum? How are we to act then? That was a more difficult question to answer. Provided this was the sixth stratum, we could very well run into the book Raziel had been desperately searching for. In that case, we would need to make it finding it our top priority. Uh, what if, well, would we, what if this was the fifth stratum then? Would we search for the gates of the sixth stratum and keep pressing onwards? After all, this place had no master overseeing it. If we reached the sixth stratum, Raziel's long cherished wish would be fulfilled. She could finally retrieve her book. The Sefa Raziel, a tome containing all divine knowledge of creation, a book she had written for herself, then entrusted it to mankind as a show of faith. If at all possible, I wanted to fulfill that dream of hers. I greeted Raziel upon her return, then asked if she had found anything of note. I got my hopes up in vain. Either way, we now had to decide whether to retrace our steps or continue onwards. Raziel promptly froze in place. After a few moments, she suddenly seemed to have come to some sort of conclusion. Not exactly the most reassuring of replies. She silently shook her head. Back on the first stratum, we stepped outside to give Gethel's body to the sea. If this, if this were, by any chance, the seventh stratum, we should be extremely close to Tokyo Babel's summit, a place not a soul had seen, let alone reached up until now. Sure. I had no reason to refuse. We both pushed ourselves away from the ground, leapt into the skies, and began flying side by side. After a few moments of consideration, I gave her an uncertain nod. An accidental slip of the tongue on my part. Razel kept staring at me, refusing to swallow any sort of excuse that might claim it was just her imagination. And so I gave in. Feeling like I'd just been liberated from a tremendous burden, my tone gradually shifted back to how it used to be. I produced a bitter smile, still uncertain how she would react to hearing about my past. She was an angel, after all, and also someone who never forcefully inquires about said past. But I think she'd started to suspect something. My powers, the way I tacked, talked, and acted, and what little I had shared about my past, the world I used to call home. A world succumbed to endless conflict, having lost its final ray of hope. Talking about the past wasn't easy, but if the need arose, anyone would have strength enough to reveal it. However, I needed a different kind of strength, a different kind of resolve, in order to reveal my past at Raziel. I did not wish to be scorned. I did not wish for her to fear me. 
or become sad because of me. Those worries have been on my mind constantly. Urged on by Raziel, I ended up landing in the middle of the Tsukiji market. The stench of fish was somewhat unpleasant. What should we do? I had a feeling Raziel was kind of giddy with excitement. Now that I think about it, there had been some trouble with foreign tourists at the Tsukiji market a number of years ago. Truth be told, I did actually witness the work of a sushi cook once before. I shouldn't be able to mimic that easily enough. On the other hand, I didn't have the proper rice. B besides... Razio blinked back at me in confusion. I seemed to have touched upon something thoroughly unexpected. She thrust her hand into her pocket, trying desperately to fish out something. Um, not to be rude, but it clearly wouldn't be there. <laughs> she pulled out a sword, then a shield. Is that a fucking Vita? Her pocket must have connected to, unironically enough, a pocket dimension. She kept pulling item after item from it. Various weapons, pieces of armor, as well as accessories, both seemingly important and useless, piling them up into a small into a small mountain. What the? <laughs> Relieved, she triumphantly held up the box lunch in question. <laughs> Could you lose a thing if it was inside a pocket dimension? Also, what was she planning to do with the mountain of bits and bobs accumulated behind her? Sure, why not? Yeah, someone that doesn't stink. We ended up finding a nearby sushi shop that still had its interior in good enough shape. Fresh sushi toppings lined the shells, but they were all neatly preserved and sliced up, emitting no smell. Raziel looked at me nervously, chewing on her thumb. I did plan to take her hand, but... For now. The moment I said that, she flushed bright red, responding just like a young human girl would. Hmm. We sat down next to each other, setting the two lunch boxes on the table. Her smile froze up, then there. I opened my lunch box as well, immediately comprehend the reasons behind her shock. Well, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't expecting something like this. This certainly was a universal problem faced by many. The larger the box, the more difficult it was to handle it. One had to be careful never to carry it vertically like one would a book. Unless they wanted it to end up like this. It was a sorry sight, truly. Almost difficult to look at. The fried chicken mixed in with the tamagayaki, taking on a peculiar hue with pieces of rice ball hanging off of it. The salad was all over the place, with thin pieces of cabbage coiling about the apple slices. The apple itself ended up soaking in grease as it pressed against the pieces of fried chicken. Oh, don't worry. Raza was on the verge of tears, or rather had already begun to cry. Just looking at her made my heart ache. I instinctively clutched my own chest. Seeing Raziel sink deeper and deeper into despair, buckling under the pressure while shedding gigantic tears of despair, I simply could not hold myself back any longer. With chopsticks in hand, I reached out towards a piece of fried chicken as Raziel looked at me round-eyed. I smiled back at her, then swiftly popped the chicken into my mouth. I began chewing on the apple chicken, pleased with both its tender texture and flavor. One can barely tell that the flavors were mixed up. <laughs> Raziel quickly pulled the box away from me, glaring with the expression of a child who was robbed of her favorite toy. <laughs> I exhaled a long sigh. Knowing words would be insufficient in making her understand, I quickly scooped up a piece of the fried chicken and forced it into her mouth. <laughs> Raziel's features gradually loosened. Actually, yes. 
Next, I went for the tamagoyaki. Most likely due to how unappetizing it looked, Raziel stared at me with her breath held as I carried the food to my mouth. The texture itself was hardly anything to write home about, but the moderate sweetness to the flavor had a certain nostalgic feel to it. She nervously opened her mouth, after which I carefully placed a piece of the food into it. Can I just say that this, this, the atmosphere of this story is completely all over the place? We were close to death, and now we're just enjoying a lunch, a freaking boxed lunches that got mixed mixed up. I dig it. Raziel must have been acting so bashful because she realized she was praising her own cooking. Honestly though, the food was good enough to genuinely feel proud about. We spent the rest of the time quietly nibbling away at our food. The only objectionable part I could think of was how the fried chicken's oil soaked into the apple. Nonetheless, I dutifully ate everything up without difficulty. Good job, bro. We pressed our hands together in brief prayer, then helped ourselves to some of the tea we found lining the shop shelves. After taking a long sip, we both exhaled a satisfied sigh. I managed to calm my nerves, stealing a sideways glance at Raziel. I noticed her gazing intently at the ripples in her teacup. <laughs> it's drugged! Based on what I'd heard before, the Angels of Heaven lived off of a substance called Soma. Its flavor must have been of the highest, most exquisite quality. Naturally, we had no such thing here at Tokyo Babel. A small handful of angels still held onto their emergency reserves, but that was about it. Raziel thought to herself for a few moments, then cocked her head to the side, giving no clear indication of what her response was. What was it about heaven that made people want to live there at all costs? After all, they did not even have books. Yeah, who the hell needs heaven? That was a dreamlike notion at best. Nothing lasted forever. Eternity was an illusion. Even now, we kept pressing onwards, weathering all the hardships that came our way. Even still, that brief, blissful time we spent together. Razel shook her head, defying her own dream while staring reality straight in the eye. I comprehended her reasoning, yet there was one particular issue still tugging at the, tugging at the back of my mind, even though I'd never even considered it up until now. I could have done without that week, maybe at the end. Either way, I doubt Lilith had anything in particular in mind. Even if she did, she would deny it. Raziel hung her head, her words softening. I had the feeling that was an invitation of sorts. Heaven, God's paradise, a realm of eternal bliss and happiness. I had no such right. 
ラジエリ僕は人殺しなんだよ She stared back at me in confusion ゲテルとクロウミヤコのことなら気にやまなくてもいい一人は天使一人は天使ぐらいどちらも助けられない存在 And now the dark tone shift. My expression had no doubt clouded over as I uttered the words. I set down my teacup neatly on the table. Longing for the touch of another, I reached out and clasped Raziel's hand. She jolted back for a moment, almost as if in refusal. Her entire body shaken by a chill. Raziel found herself at a loss for words. She gave my hand a squeeze, never once letting go of it. Their voices buzzed in my ear like a swarm of insects. Enough. Quiet down. I clearly remember being overcome by such negative emotions. As an infant, I was made into an exhibition, but to be gawked at by people in a pure white room. They took out most care to maintain hygiene, almost to an unnatural degree. White, white, white as far as I could see. Nothing more, just white. I despised that color. And that was another thing that crossed my mind at the time. I possessed clear, ordered, logical thoughts, hardly a feat common in newborn children. But I was special. I was chosen by the people of this world. As far as parallel worlds were concerned, mine was exceptionally heretical. There existed worlds ruled by dinosaurs, others by mankind. Some fell victim to nuclear warfare, others to natural disasters. Some even advanced their technology far enough to make successful voyages to the far depths of space. Yet all of those worlds had one common characteristic, faith. Myths of a myriad names, carrying a myriad traditions. The name may have differed in each world. Spirits, angels, god, or fate. But the fact remained that people believed in the existence of an unseen and infinitely va vast force. That was no doubt a consequence of the existence of angels and demons. People of every world believed in some form of spirituality. Some kind of a higher, supernatural existence. My world was different. We turned our backs on all such notions. What could have been the cause? The gradual depletion of mankind's vital resources through natural disasters and a change in the Earth's crust? Or perhaps because men and women, young and old alike, accepted a world of incessant turmoil and war where bloodshed only birthed even more bloodshed? Indeed, our world had rejected God. Ours was a world governed by complete rationality, rejecting the supernatural and the spiritual. In other words, forces transcending mere natural phenomena. We did experience an age of the occult. However, it soon found itself exposed and made almost redundant by rationality. The spirit was subordinated to the category of mere natural phenomena, while psychic abilities fell under the field of physics. And soon enough, we ended up completely rejecting the idea of a supposedly all-seeing, all-knowing god. Life's numerous misfortunes were attributed to mere coincidence, not fate. The horrors of the world were the work of men, not a cabal of demons. Similarly, the many wonders of this world were hardly the gift of angels, but the crystallization of mankind's relentless efforts. We continued to grow and expand, eventually gaining dominance over both the earth and nature itself. We overcame all natural disasters. Religion did not exist. Neither did people clinging on to a higher being. Everyone lived only for themselves. Following the complete erosion of national borders and the establishment of a one-world government, the world Earth's population exceeded 10 billion. And so, mankind came to a realization that they were weary of it all. Indeed, mankind found itself exhausted, sick of wars, of conflict, even of victory. Their hearts and minds had been worn down and on the verge of collapse. They yearned for something to cling on to, something to rely on, someone to lend an ear to their pleas. All 10 billion people nurtured that same idea. Normally, a being to fulfill such wishes would be called a god, all-knowing and omnipotent. However, our world had already rejected God, denied this, the existence of a conveniently all-powerful being. Guided by that mindset, we built a highly advanced society that refused to depend on a being such as God. 
The course of our history bordered on the miraculous, yet here we were, at our collective wit's end. As world population exceeded 80 billion, the fires of war, thought to have long since been extinguished, came sparking back to life all across the globe. The aggressor's goals were neither resources nor territory gain. They attacked out of rage, irritation, sadness and despair, igniting conflict after conflict without end. And so, our unified world had begun working on a singular project. We had already turned our backs on the foolish notion of an omnipotent god a good 2,000 years before. However, we ended up devoting human history to the guidance of others. We had enough. No more. We were so tired, weary beyond words. And so, we chose to create our own omnipotent god. Through the power of cutting-edge technology, we would create God, in other word. In any other world, such an action would no doubt be labeled as the ultimate hubris. However, our world had no such creator, only mankind, arrogant in its rationality. And so we created God. If we were to give birth to a person to act as God, he would need not to be created in the image of man, and that is exactly what we did. Create a living being resembling a human. His birth would not be carried out by way of a maternal womb either. After all, we were guided by rationality, down to the very last details. And God was a unique being, peerless in all the world. He would not be born from the womb of a mere human. Life would be created from zero, granted intelligence and elevated to godhood. It was a tremendously ambitious project, its scope rivaled only by its sheer folly, yet the world at large had high hopes for its completion. They were weary of life and wished to rest. It was a notion shared by every man and woman. She introduced herself to me as Tendao Naru. I clearly recall hearing her name, even through the walls of my capsule, filled to the brim with amniotic fluid. Her lips curled upwards, and I found her smile beautiful. That one thought stayed with me. Only she would greet me with a smile, when none of the other nameless researchers did. She went on, gently leaning against the capsule I was in. I couldn't help but spot a hint of sadness lurking behind her smile. My first words were neither mommy nor daddy, but the name of a woman, Tendo Naru. And so the days trickled on. Eventually I was removed from the amniotic fluid and was born as God, however I was not yet perfect. I required education. So I studied history. I learned from the follies of our forefathers while also acquainting myself with positive qualities such as nobility, virtue, and bravery. The history of man was one written blood, and so I too had learned the art of war. My body had been endowed with a variety of special abilities, divided into categories such as Hino Kakutsuchi, Tajikara Wo, Takimikazuchi, and so on. Those skills were hardly magic, but rather the modifications of certain physical abilities. They were granted to me following a careful study of the various characteristics of electric eels and insects. Nothing more, nothing less. They were powers that held no meaning beyond performance. I grew up at an abnormal rate. Although this was partly due to the accelerants I had been administered, the primary reason originated in the fact that humanity itself could not bear to wait more than another decade or two at best. Please save us, we're begging you, help us. Their cries echoed in my ears each and every day. I was told that my words and actions would soothe their pain. My tone and speech patterns were corrected after about two or three months. Her soft laugh chimed in the air. I looked at her confused. After three months, I first discovered what role she played in all this. A problematic woman who was indispensable to the project, but should never have been a part of it. Such were the circumstances of Tendo Naru, the woman who gave me my name. I'm not sure if I'm a 
いいのいいの私が呼びやすいようにしているだけだからまああなたが自分のことをそう認識してくれるならそれに越したことはないけど大丈夫なんですかあなたがなろうとしているものなんて世界中でさまざまな名前があるのよなら私が私にだけ通じる名を与えたところで問題ないでしょ I met her nonchalant tone with a smile, wondering if what she had told me was true. <laughs> Naru flashed a smile at me, which in turn made me hide mine. Indeed, indeed, for God must never be seen smiling. <laughs> Her words appeared to run counter to everything I had been taught, everything this project and all its other members aimed to accomplish. She smiled at my warning. She placed her hand on my head. To this day, I still remember its gentle warmth. Her job entailed not my instruction, but the creation of my body. The body of God needed to exude strength and beauty, and so her orders dictated. I occasionally had trouble understanding what Naru meant. Naru allowed me to relax my tone when it was just the two of us. It made me somewhat happy that I could have a secret to share with her. あなたは強い。間違いなく、疑いようもなく、この地上で最強を誇る肉体を手に入れたわ。なる。Waves of sorrow washed over her gaze, lips trembling and on the verge of tears, Naru ran her thin, ice cold fingers along my cheek. He might still be alive. Her whisper was not meant for my ears, yet my exceedingly keen hearing picked up on it, carving each syllable deep into my mind. As nothing would be kept private from me, I had full access to the facility's information terminal, which allowed me to learn of Naru's past. Thinking back on it in retrospect, I wished I had never found out. There was once a boy named Tendao Setsuna, Naru's son. However, about a year ago he passed away. The cause of death was aging. His body aged at an increasingly accelerated rate compared to the normal human, leading to his untimely demise despite medical treatment. My name stood as a substitute for him, who was never given the time to enjoy life to its fullest. I would be lying if I said the thought of having been made the substitute for a complete stranger didn't affect me at least somewhat negatively. However, I ended up being, however, I ended up being surprisingly tough. There was nothing to be done about it. She was tormented by grief and possibly hatred as well. I had no intention of letting Naru know that I had learned of her past. However, having acquired that knowledge, I couldn't help but feel something in her gaze whenever we were together. It was not hatred, though not quite love either. Something similar to the latter, but still a touch different. Obsessive attachment could be the most appropriate way to put it. Time and again, the two of us would spend time, some time together to chat. And every time, I saw a glint of quiet madness in her eyes. Despite all that, she was both a genius and my surrogate mother. One day, when it was just the two of us. あなた。自分を特別視しすぎてない。きっとあなたは特別な存在となるけれど。それだけは忘れちゃいけないわ。ああ。切な。切な。切な。私の可愛い。愛しい。憎い切な。愛しているわ。本当に。
My memories wished to reject it, yet my mind fully comprehended the words she spoke next, her curse in disguise. That day, I cried for the first time in my life. Naru was dismissed from the project soon after that. I continued to grow and learn. However, the world was corrupted beyond belief. They would not be able to wait for me to complete my education. Three years was soon shortened to a single year. The world would have been consumed by the flames of conflict had they not done that. My initially rapid growth slowed down somewhat. My physical appearance was designed to shift from that of a young adult in his 20s to someone in his 30s within the span of another two years. However, it was decided that I would be revealed to the public after only a year. The higher-ups felt things would go smoothly. Only a handful of researchers who idolized Tendao Naru ended up voicing their objections. Once I skimmed through the manuscript I had been handed, they dragged me out into the open. I had to wear a set of peculiar clothing said to have a calming psychological effect on people. I was ready to endure that much. After being created as God and raised as such, I felt prepared to live out my life as God. I felt the beat of my heart loud and clear in my chest as an inexplicable pain assailed the whole of my body. My stomach felt heavy, almost like I had been stabbed with a knife. Their cries of joy buzzed in my ears like a swarm of insects. Enough. Quiet down. Words of denial bubbled forth to the forefront of my mind. Frail words, yet ones that spoke the undeniable truth. Their incessant cries of joy buried me like an avalanche. I'd had enough. I wanted this to end. I felt my heart overcome by disgust fierce enough to make me want to vomit, despair intense enough to make me want to cry. I came to know the feeling men call fear. I was scared. And once fear nestled itself into one's heart, it would never let go. Yet my fear carried me onwards, almost involuntarily due to how many times I had practiced it. The joyful cries of the puce made many groove ever louder, shouting my name in joy, worship, and adoration. I pushed the doors open, light flooding my vision. In that moment, all fighting, all conflict, even petty squabbles ceased at once. Every man and woman held on to hope, each with a dream of their own. They earnestly believed that a being like me would guide them to salvation, and I had to fulfill that duty. To bear the burden of ten billion, the reality of it came crashing down on me like a tidal wave. Become God. Shoulder their burden. Guide them. Later, once I had come to Tokyo Babel, I would recall that day from time to time. Tarinakatanoa But that was not how it all went down. The beating of my own heart and their cries of joy all irritated me. People irritated me. The way they looked at me with eyes full of expectation. I would soon be the salvation of countless people, and I myself would not be saved from anyone. I'd been... I had been created for that purpose alone. My memories of that day were a jumbled, vague mess. The people I overlooked filled me with dread and contempt, driving me to scream at the top of my lungs. <laughs> I screamed. The joyful buzz of the crowd died down an instant as the very air seemed to freeze. The people below looked up at me with astonishment. Unable to bear their gazes, I mustered all my strength to flee that place. What followed was hell itself. I fled the facility using the powers I had been given to destroy the outer walls and make my way outside. Naturally, the organization responsible for my birth attempted to hunt me down, but their efforts ultimately proved fruitless. The people revolted, driven by crippling hopelessness, they stormed the gates of the research facility. You lied to us. How dare you? Despicable liars and cheats, every last one of you. Their crushed hopes amplified their despair. Tearing down all obstacles in their way, they enra the enraged mob massacred the researchers. 
Once their bloody work was done, they began to turn on each other, killing everyone in sight. Oh, so this must have been the tragedy. And all the people around the world who saw these events unfold through the media ended up igniting the flames of war once again. However, this war differed from those preceding it. This wasn't the result of mere irritation. The reason was rather the fact that they had simply given up on the world as a whole. And so people kept killing and killing, murdering everyone in their sight, be they family or loved ones. In a sense, those who chose not to kill faced an even harsher fate. They ceased to function. They stopped moving, going to school or work, they even stopped eating, and eventually they simply perished. Revolts soon popped up at every part of the globe, weapons of mass destruction were unleashed, nuclear missiles rained down upon the continents, and automatic nuclear retaliation gave birth to the kind of chaos and turmoil the world had yet to experience. World leaders once appointed to guide their people committed suicide. Some with smiles on their faces, others with tears running down their cheeks, some simply succumbed to rage and murderous impulse. It was the end of the world as we knew it. With everything fallen to ruin and no leader to rely on, there was no need for any for even guidance. Love was deemed a wicked illusion, childbirth a grave sin. The world rapidly hurried toward its own demise, and I was there watching it all unfold. I ran and ran as far as I could go. I unconsciously headed for the countryside in Scotland where Naru lived. According to her personal file, Nara had been living in quiet seclusion ever since her dismissal from the Research Institute. However, when I got there, I found her home in complete ruins. A faint smile lingered on her lips as she leaned against a wall of debris. As I rushed closer, she covered my lips with her index finger. Her blood was dark in hue she most likely had her liver damaged. Drops of blood bubbled from her mouth as she spoke, signs of a punctured lung, no doubt. Regardless, one thing was painfully clear. She was dying and did not have much time left. Nara mustered a painful smile. This wasn't my fault. I wanted to say those words, but for some reason couldn't. Knowing that once I uttered it, something in me would cease to be. そうよ。確かにあなたの思っている通り、この世界は爆薬のようなものだった。本来なら見逃される方の小さな火花だけで滅んでしまうような脆弱な世界だった。でもそれでも。I never wished for this to happen. I simply wanted to resist the overwhelming pressure I felt. Nara gently dug her fingers into my hair. I held her hand in mine, clutching it tightly. What was I to do? That one thought dominated my mind. I was confused, stricken by panic. She would soon die, and there was no doubt of, there was no there was no doubt about that. Was I to fight until the very end to try and save her? Or was there something else for me to do? Damn it all! I was endlessly ignorant, blind to everything. The tears came without warning. I attempted to hold them back, but couldn't. I was afraid of my body turning into something I no longer recognized. Afraid of shedding tears. Nara produced a final apologetic smile and died. I was unable to even grant her final wish. 
Cradling Naru's lifeless body in my arms, I continued to cry, the tears welling forth without end. My memories of what followed were vague at best. The world edged closer to its destruction at a rapid pace, but in the end, it fell into a languid state of decline. Both the people who kept killing each other and those who took their own lives had all died. The only kind of people left were those who simply watched in complete inaction as their fellow men died in front of their eyes. Gasoline explosions charred the skies, filling it with raging fire. The moans of those trapped by the flames could be heard in the distance. However, they no longer had the will to even scream. I took to wandering, moving from place to place as I hoped to run into someone to help. Someone who still had the will to live. However, all such people had long since died. It hardly surprised me. After all, the people who still held onto life no doubt tried to stop those massacring their fellow citizens. And were killed in the process. This was my responsibility. I wandered the desolate streets, witnessing with my own eyes as 10 billion lives were eroded to zero. They all died. Killed by me. I drove them to their deaths. I could no longer cry. Tears only filled me with guilt. I continued to wander, my expression a hollow mask bereft of emotions. Death would bring no relief, so I pressed on, holding on to life as the reality of what I had done continued to gnaw away at my heart. In the end, I collapsed in front of a building consumed by fire. I gave my body to the ground, waiting for death's hour to strike. Each of the 10 billion people on the planet had an ID number engraved on their bodies, displaying their life signals in the information terminal. Just now, all those signals disappeared. To the very end, I couldn't save a single life. I couldn't carry out my duty, far from it in fact. With nothing left to do, I had turned into the relic of a bygone age. One day, extraterrestrials could visit the planet, or another species might evolve and gain intelligence. Either way, it was no longer my place to interfere. So I decided to simply lay down and wait for death. Without fulfillment, an end devoid of hope and despair. As I lay there, ready to accept my fate, I witnessed a scene out of this world. <laughs> Impossible. And that's when they met Lilith and Raziel. I looked up into the eyes of a young girl, her locks gleaming crimson in the flames surrounding us. She adjusted her long hair, a hint of tedium reflected in her movements as she locked gaze with me. With me. She seemed not the least bit concerned with the end of this world, her tone carrying out not a shred of urgency. Another girl glanced in my direction from behind the dark-haired one, observing me with a vacant, uninterested gaze. <laughs> Very well. I trusted them. I believed they were who they claimed to be. That they were an angel and a demon. I believed every last word they spoke. Following that, I once again changed the way I talked. In accordance with my newly gained mission, I would travel to Tokyo Babylon and hunt down angels, demons, and mortals alike. I was not an ordinary human, far from it. I may have been born in fortunate circumstances, yet the support I received was not so I could live out my life as an everyday person. But here in this world, I was nothing more than a mortal man who had stayed strayed slightly from his path. Which is why I held Tokyo Babel so dear, loving it with all my heart and soul. I would lay down my very life to save it. That was the conclusion I had arrived at, and the way I still lived my life even now. Once put into words, my life was actually a fairly brief affair. Raziel parted her lip to say something, but no words came. She nodded, averting her gaze from mine, then returning it after a few moments. For a brief period of time, she gazed deep into my eyes. The fact I caught no glimpse of any disgust in her face filled me with inexplicable relief. I harbored feelings of friendship, or possibly something more towards Raziel. If asked whether there existed a feeling between friendship and love, I would have no doubt produced a confused smile. I had no idea, nor had I ever felt something this ambiguous. But this much I could say with certainty. I did enjoy the company of Lilith, Sormi, Camiel, and Beliel. Whatever I harbored towards Raziel was something ever so slightly different, though. 
As such, when I saw her expression lacking any hint of disgust, I felt overcome by relief. Raziel seemed hesitant to ask a question, but ultimately did so anyway. I gazed up at the ceiling, letting my eyes wander across its wooden texture. I just revealed something of critical importance. Raziel stared back at me, completely dumbfounded. Naturally, I wasn't ever meant to simply just die. All my memories would have been implanted into the next unit, the next Tendao Setsuna, extending my life. My life was tremendously condensed compared to that of a normal human, a body that normally for about 80 years would be discarded in only four. Only my so-called soul, or something resembling it, would be carried on to the new host. Such a method would have granted me eternal life. I would have continued to live on as a makeshift god till the end of time. It meant exactly what she thought. Everything I did now was so I could accomplish as much as possible before being discarded. Lilith sent me out onto the battlefield in full knowledge of this, and I continued to fight, intoxicated by that thought. Such was the nature of our contract. I would be granted neither reward nor redemption. That's what she was trying to tell me. That's honestly just sad. That alone would be a reward in itself. Despite shouldering an irredeemable sin, I would be able to save others. Just as angels and demons could never become humans, I, who existed as a being not entirely human, would be denied that possibility as well. The more I dwelled on it, the farther I drifted from a conclusion. As I found myself caught in an endless loop of thoughts, Raziel suddenly embraced my head. She whispered gently into my ears. セツナ。私は天使だから、それも割と Despite her hesitation, there was genuine earnestness reflected in the angel's gaze. In short, I could only exist as me, even if I was a machine or a cyborg or whatever else. The question of whether or not I could become who I wanted to be filled me with uncertainty, but I knew I could at least attempt to, to approach that ideal. Sarmi would no doubt say something along the lines of, and she would flash that usual dazzling smile of hers, too. Wait, 
What's with the sudden pain in my arm? I glanced to my side, taking note of Raziel's visibly sulky mood. Uh... Her expression grew even more grim. I could practically make out the fire in her eyes. Uh... Damn it! You fucking ruined it, Setsuna. God damn it. How peculiar. I felt my arm being forcibly pinched by your nails, yet the sensation ended up more ticklish than anything. Because I'm a clueless idiot. Raziel's pressing tone left me somewhat flustered. In any case, after an apology, I explained the situation to her. Lilla spoke with the soothing tone of a female presenter during a government broadcast. I wish you could have told me that earlier, though. Much earlier. Okay, good lord. We've been going on for quite a while. I think I'm gonna go ahead and end it there, time-wise. But, good lord. An hour and a half, my god. A lot of shit happened in this episode. Pretty much like the last one. That, shit, that was a lot of stuff. Well, unfortunately, that's where I'm going to have to end it. Time-wise, I'm I kind of ran out. <laughs> I was trying to extend. I was trying to extend it as far as I could, but now I've kind of reached my time crunch limit. So, first off, that beginning battle was freaking awesome, and I'm just going to say it again. Freaking that. Who is that voice actor that voiced um, Uriel? He sounded very similar to the Japanese VA for Rin Okumura from Blue Exorcist. Or maybe I'm thinking of somebody else. But at the same time, it's like it's a fusion of Rin and Gilgamesh. Like the voice of Rin and then just the tone of Gilgamesh. Like just him calling him a mongrel was just what? Like, oh, that's Gilgamesh. Anyway, that was a nice little moment of clarity. Not so much, a, actually not so much a moment of clarity. More like, that's a depressing backstory. Why the fuck did I use the word clarity? I need to work on my English skills. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching, and that's where I'm going to end it. So I will see you guys in the next video.